Portugal's radical drugs policy is working. Why hasn't the world copied it? Written Tuesday, December 5th, 2017 by Susana Ferreira in The Guardian. When the drugs came, they hit all at once. It was the 80s, and by the time one in ten people had slipped into the depths of heroin use, bankers, university students, carpenters, socialites, miners, Portugal was in a state of panic. Alvaro Pereira was working as a family doctor in Olhão, in southern Portugal. People were injecting themselves in the street, in public squares, in gardens, he told me. At that time, not a day passed when there wasn't a robbery at a local business or a mugging. The crisis began in the south. The 80s were a prosperous time in Olhão, a fishing town 31 miles west of the Spanish border. Coastal waters filled fishermen's nets from the Gulf of Cadiz to Morocco. Tourism was growing, and currency flowed throughout the southern Algarve region. But by the end of the decade, heroin began washing up on Olion's shores. Overnight, Pereira's beloved slice of the Algarve coast became one of the drug capitals of Europe. One in every 100 Portuguese was battling a problematic heroin addiction at that time. But the number was even higher in the south. Headlines in the local press raised the alarm about overdose deaths and rising crime. The rate of HIV infection in Portugal became the highest in the European Union. Pereira recalled the desperate patients and families beating a path to his door, terrified, bewildered, begging for help. I got involved, he said, only because I was ignorant. In truth, there was a lot of ignorance back then. Forty years of, author of authoritarian rule. Under the regime established by Antonio Salazar in 1933, had suppressed education, weakened institutions, and lowered the school-leaving age in a strategy intended to keep the population docile. The country was closed to the outside world. People missed out on the experimentation and mind-expanding culture of the 1960s. When the regime ended abruptly in a military coup in 1974, Portugal was suddenly open to new markets and influences. Under the old regime, Coca-Cola was banned and owning a cigarette lighter required a license. When marijuana and then heroin began flooding in, the country was utterly unprepared. Pereira tackled the growing wave of addiction the only way he knew how, one patient at a time. A student in her 20s who still lived with her parents might have had a student in her 20s who still lived with her parents might have her family involved in her recovery. A middle-aged man, estranged from his wife, and living on the street, faced different risks and needed a different kind of support. Pereira improvised, calling on institutions and individuals in the community to lend a hand. In 2001, nearly two decades into Pereira's accidental specialization in addiction, Portugal became the first country to decriminalize the possession and consumption of all illicit substances. Rather than being arrested, those caught with a personal supply might be given a warning, a small fine, or told to appear before a local commission, a doctor, a lawyer, and a social worker, about treatment, harm reduction, and the support services that were available to them. The opioid crisis soon stabilized, and the ensuing years saw dramatic drops in problematic drug use, HIV, and hepatitis infection rates, overdose deaths, drug-related crime, and incarceration rates. HIV infection plummeted from an all-time high in 2000 of 104.2 new cases per million to 4.2 cases per million in 2015. The data behind these changes has been studied and cited as evidence by harm reduction movements around the globe. It's misleading, however, to credit these positive, re positive results entirely to a change in law. Portugal's remarkable recovery and the fact that it has held steady through several changes in government, including conservative leaders who would have preferred to return to the U.S.-style war on drugs, could not have happened without an enormous cultural shift and a change in how the country viewed drugs, addiction, and itself. In many ways, the law was merely a reflection of transformations that were already happening in clinics, in pharmacies, and around kitchen tables across the country. The official policy of decriminalization made it far easier for a broad range of services, health, psychiatry, employment, housing, etc., that had been struggling to pool their resources and expertise to work together more effectively to serve their communities. The language began to shift too. Those who had been referred to sneeringly as drogados, junkies, 
became known more broadly, more sympathetically, and more accurately as people who use drugs or people with addiction disorders. This, too, was crucial. It's important to note that Portugal stabilized its opioid crisis, but it didn't make it disappear. While drug-related death, incarceration, and infection rates plummeted, the country still had to deal with the health complications of long-term problematic drug use. Diseases including hepatitis C, cirrhosis, and liver cancer are a burden on a health system that's still struggling to recover from recession and cutbacks. In this way, Portugal's story serves as a warning of challenges yet to come. Despite enthusiastic international reactions to Portugal's success, local harm reduction advocates have been frustrated by what they see as stagnation and inaction since decriminalization came into effect. They criticize the state for dragging its feet on establishing supervised injection sites and drug consumption facilities, for failing to make the anti-overdose medication naloxone more readily available, for not implementing needle exchange programs in prisons. Where, they ask, is the courageous spirit and bold leadership that pushed the country to decriminalize drugs in the first place? In the early days of Portugal's panic, when Pereira's beloved Olion began falling apart in front of him, the state's first instinct was to attack. Drugs were denounced as evil, drugs users, drug users were demonized, and proximity to either was criminally and spiritually punishable. The Portuguese government launched a series of national anti-drug campaigns that were less, just say no, and more, drugs are Satan. Informal treatment approaches and experiments were rushed into use throughout the country as doctors, psychiatrists, and pharmacists worked independently to deal with the flood of drug dependency disorders at their doors, sometimes risking ostracism or arrest to do what they believed was best for their patients. In 1977, in the north of the country, Psychiatrist Eduino Lopez pioneered a methadone program at the Centro de Boa Vista in Porto. Lopez was the first doctor in continental Europe to experiment with substitution therapy, flying in methadone powder from Boston under the auspices of the Ministry of Justice rather than the Ministry of Health. His efforts met with a vicious public bash backlash and the disapproval of his peers, who considered methadone therapy nothing more than state-sponsored drug addiction. In Lisbon, Odette Ferreira, an experienced pharmacist and pioneering HIV researcher, started an unofficial needle exchange program to address the growing AIDS crisis. She received death threats from drug dealers and legal threats from politicians. Ferreira, who is now in her 90s and still has enough swagger to carry off long, fake eyelashes and red leather at a midday meeting, started giving away clean syringes in the middle of Europe's biggest open-air drug market, in the Casal Ventoso neighborhood of Lisbon. She collected donations of clothing, soap, razors, condoms, fruit, and sandwiches, and distributed them to users. When dealers reacted with hostility, she snapped back, Don't mess with me. You do your job and I'll do mine. She then bullied the Portuguese Association of Pharmacies into running the country's, and indeed the world's, first national needle exchange program. A flurry of expensive private clinics and free faith-based facilities emerged, promising detoxes and miracle cures, but the first public drug treatment center run by the Ministry of Health, Centro das Taipas, in Lisbon, did not begin operating until 1987. Strapped for resources in Olion, Pereira sent a few patients for treatment, although he did not agree with the abstinence-based approach used at Taipas. First, you take away the drug and then with psychotherapy you plug up the crack, said Pereira. There was no scientific evidence to show that this would work, and it didn't. He also sent patients to Lopez's methadone program in Porto and found that some responded well, but Porto was at the other end of the country. He wanted to try methadone for his patients, but the Ministry of Health hadn't yet approved it for use. To get around that, Pereira sometimes asked a nurse to sneak methadone to him in the boot of his car. Pereira's work treating patients for addiction eventually caught the attention of the Ministry of Health. They heard there was a crazy man in the Algarve who was working on his own, he said with a slow smile. Now, 68, he is sprightly and charming, with an athletic build, thick and wavy white hair that bounces when he walks, a gravelly drawl, and a bottomless reserve of warmth. They came down to find me at the clinic and proposed that I open a treatment center, he said. 
he invited a colleague from a family practice in the next town over. He invited a colleague from out of family practice in the next town over to join him, a young local doctor named Zhuang Gulong. Gulong was a 20-year-old medical student when he was offered his first hit of heroin. He declined because he didn't know what it was. By the time he finished school, got his license, and began practicing medicine at a health center in the southern city of Faro, it was everywhere. Like Pereira, he accidentally ended up specializing in treating drug addiction. The two young colleagues joined forces to open Southern Portugal's first CAT in 1988. These kinds of centers have used different names and acronyms over the years, but are still commonly referred to as Centros de Atendimento a Tóxico Dependentes, or CATs. Local residents were vehemently opposed the doctors were improvising treatments as they went along. The following month, Pereira and Goulon opened a second CAT in Ulion, and other family doctors opened more in the north and central regions, forming a loose network. It had become clear to a growing number of practitioners that the most effective response to addiction had to be personal and rooted in communities. And rooted in communities. Treatment was still small-scale, local, and largely ad hoc. The first official call to change Portugal's drug laws came from Rui Pereira, a former constitutional court judge who undertook an overhaul of the penal code in 1996. He found the practice of jailing people for taking drugs to be counterproductive and unethical. My thought right off the bat was that it wasn't legitimate for the state to punish users, he told me in his office at the University of Lisbon School of Law. At that time, about half the people in prison were there for drug-related reasons, and the epidemic, he said, was thought to be an irresolvable problem. He recommended that drug use be discouraged without imposing penalties or further alienating users. His proposals weren't immediately adopted, but they did not go unnoticed. In 1997, after 10 years of running the CAT in Faro, Goulon was invited to help design and lead a national drug strategy. He assembled a team of experts to study potential solutions to Portugal's drug problem. The resulting recommendations, including the full decriminalization of drug use, were presented in 1999, approved by the Council of Ministers in 2000, and a new national plan of action came into effect in 2001. Today, Goulon is Portugal's drug czar. He has been the lodestar throughout eight alternating conservative and progressive administrations, through heated standoffs with lawmakers and lobbyists through shifts in scientific understanding of addiction and in cultural tolerance for drug use, through austerity cuts and through a global policy climate that only very recently became slightly less hostile. Goulon is also decriminalization's busiest global ambassador. He travels almost nonstop, invited again and again to present the successes of Portugal's harm reduction experiment to authorities around the world from Norway to Brazil, which are dealing with desperate situations in their own countries. These social movements take time, Goulon told me. The fact that this happened across the board in a conservative society such as ours had some impact. If the heroin epidemic had affected only Portugal's lower classes or racialized minorities and not the middle or upper classes, he doubts the conversation around drugs, addiction, and harm reduction would have taken shape in the same way. There was a point when you could not find a single Portuguese family that wasn't affected. Every family had their addict or addicts. This was universal in a way that the society felt. We have to do something. Portugal's policy rests on three pillars. One, that there's no such thing as a soft or hard drug, only healthy and unhealthy relationships with drugs. Two, that an individual's unhealthy relationship with drugs often conceals frayed relationships with loved ones, with the world around them, and with themselves, and three, that the eradication of all drugs is an impossible goal. The national policy is to treat each individual differently, Gulung told me. The secret is for us to be present. A drop-in center called Immuraria sits unobtrusively in a lively, rapidly gentrifying neighborhood of Lisbon, a long-time enclave of marginalized, a long-time enclave of marginalized communities. 
From 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., the center provides services to undocumented migrants and refugees. From 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., they open their doors to drug users. A staff of psychologists, doctors, and peer support workers, themselves former drug users, offer clean needles, pre-cut pre squares of foil, crack kits, sandwiches, coffee, clean clothing, toiletries, rapid HIV testing, and consultations, all free and anonymous. On the day I visited, young people stood around waiting for HIV test results while others played cards, complained about police harassment, tried on outfits, traded advice on living situations, watched movies, and gave pep talks to one another. They varied in age, religion, ethnicity, and gender identity, and came from all over the country and all over the world. When a slender, older man emerged from the bathroom, unrecognizable after having shaved his beard off, an energetic young man who had been flipping through magazines threw up his arms and cheered. He then turned to a quiet man sitting on my other side, his beard lush and dark hair curling from under his cap, and said, What about you? Why don't you go shave off that beard? You can't give up on yourself, man. That's when it's all over. The bearded man cracked a smile. During my visits over the course of a month, I got to know some of the peer support workers, including Joong, a compact man with blue eyes, who was rigorous in going over the details and nuances of what I was learning. Joong wanted to be sure I understood their role at the drop-in center was not to force anyone to stop using, but to help minimize the risks users were exposed to. Our objective is not to steer people towards treatment, he said. They have to want it. But even when they do want to stop using, he continued, having support workers accompany them to appointments and treatment facilities can feel like a burden on the user. And if the treatment doesn't go well, there's the risk that the person will feel too ashamed to return to the drop-in center. Then we lose them, and that's not what we want to do, Zhuang said. I want them to come back when they relapse. Failure was part of the treatment process, he told me. And he would know. Zhuang is a marijuana legalization activist, open about being HIV positive, and after being absent for part of his son's youth, he is delighting in his new role as a grandfather. He had stopped doing speedballs, mixtures of cocaine and opiates, after several painful failed treatment attempts, each more destructive than the last. He long used cannabis as a form of therapy. Methadone did not work for him, nor did any of the inpatient treatment programs he had tried. But the cruel hypocrisy of decriminalization meant that, although smoking weed was not a criminal offense, purchasing it was. His last and worst relapse came when he went to buy marijuana from his usual dealer and was told, I don't have that right now, but I do have some good cocaine. Joong said no thanks and drove away, but soon found himself headed to a cash machine and then back to the dealer. After this relapse, he embarked on a new relationship and started his own business. At one point, he had more than 30 employees. And then the financial crisis hit. Clients weren't paying, and creditors started knocking on my door, he told me. Within six months, I had burned through everything I had built up over four or five years. In the mornings, I followed the center's street teams out to the fringes of Lisbon. I met Hakel and Sareya, their slim forms swimming in the large high-vis vests they wear on their shifts, who worked with Crescer na Maior, a harm reduction NGO. Six times a week, they loaded up a large white van with drinking water, wet wipes, gloves, boxes of tin foil, and piles of state-issued drug kits, green plastic pouches with single-use servings of filtered water, citric acid, a small metal tray for cooking, gauze, filter, and a clean syringe. Portugal does not yet have any supervised injection sites, although there is legislation to allow them. Several attempts to open one have come to nothing. Portugal does not yet have any supervised injection sites. Although there is legislation to allow them, several attempts to open one have come to nothing. So, Raquel and Sareia told me, they go out to the open-air sites where they know people go to buy and use. Both are trained psychologists, but out on the streets they are simply known as the Needle Girls. Good afternoon, Raquel called out cheerfully as we walked across a seemingly abandoned lot in an area called Cruz Vermelha. Street team. People materialized from their hiding places, like some strange version of whack-a-mole, poking their heads out from the holes in the wall where they had gone to smoke or shoot up. 
My needle girls, one woman cooed to them tenderly. How are you, my loves? Most made polite conversation, updating the workers on their health struggles, their love lives, immigration woes, or housing needs. One woman told them she would be going back to Angola to deal with her mother's estate, that she was looking forward to the change of scenery. Another man told them that he had managed to get his online girlfriend's visa approved for a visit. Does she know you're still using? Sadia asked. The man looked sheepish. I start methadone tomorrow, another man said proudly. He was accompanied by his beaming girlfriend and waved a warm goodbye to the girl as they handed him a square of foil. In the foggy northern city of Porto, peer support workers from Caso, an association run for and by drug users and former users, the only one of its kind in Portugal, meet every week at a noisy cafe. They come here every Tuesday morning to down espressos, fresh pastries, and toasted sandwiches and to talk out the challenges, debate drug policy, which a decade and a half after the law came into effect was still confusing for many, and argue with the warm rowdiness that is characteristic of people in the northern region. When I asked them what they thought of Portugal's move to treat drug users as sick people in need of help rather than criminals, they scoffed, sick? We don't say sick up here. We're not sick. I was told this again and again in the north. Thinking of drug addiction simply in terms of health and disease was too reductive. Some people are able to use drugs for years without any major disruption to their personal or professional relationships. It only became a problem, they told me, when it became a problem. Casa was supported by APTES, a development NGO with a focus on harm reduction and empowerment, including programs geared towards recreational users. Their award-winning check-in project has for years set up shop at festivals, bars, and parties to test substances for dangers. I was told more than once that if drugs were legalized, not just decriminalized, then these substances would be held to the same rigorous quality and safety standards as food, drink, and medication. In spite of Portugal's tangible results, other countries have been reluctant to follow. The Portuguese began seriously considering decriminalization in 1998, immediately following the first UN General Assembly special session. The first UN General Assembly special session on the global drug problem, UN gas. High-level UN gas meetings are convened every 10 years to set drug policy for all member states, addressing trends in addiction, infection, money laundering, trafficking, and cartel violence. At the first session, to which the slogan was, A Drug-Free World, We Can Do It, Latin American member states pressed for a radical rethinking of the war on drugs, but every effort to examine alternative models, to examine alternative models, but every effort to examine alternative models, such as decriminalization, was blocked. By the time of the next session in 2008, worldwide drug use and violence related to the drug trade had vastly increased. An extraordinary session was held last year, but it was largely a disappointment. The outcome document didn't mention harm reduction once. Despite that letdown, 2016 produced a number of promising other developments. Chile and Australia opened their first medical cannabis clubs, following the lead of several others. Four more U.S. states introduced medical cannabis and four more legalized recreational. Denmark opened the world's largest drug consumption facility, and France opened its first. South Africa proposed legalizing medical cannabis. Canada outlined a plan to legalize recreational cannabis nationally and to open more supervised injection sites, and Ghana announced it would decriminalize all personal drug use. The biggest change in global attitudes and policy has been the momentum behind cannabis legalization. Local activists have pressed Goulon to take a stance on regulating cannabis and legalizing its sale in Portugal. For years, he has responded that the time was not right. Legalizing a single substance would call into question the foundation of Portugal's drug and harm reduction philosophy. If the drugs aren't the problem, if the problem is the relationship with drugs, if there's no such thing as a hard or a soft drug, and if all illicit substances are to be treated equally, he argued, then shouldn't all drugs be legalized, be legalized and regulated? Massive international cultural shifts in thinking about drugs and addiction are needed to make way for decriminalization and legalization globally. In the U.S., the White House has remained reluctant to address what drug policy reform advocates have termed 
an addiction to punishment. But if conservative, isolationist, Catholic Portugal could transform into a country where same-sex marriage and abortion are illegal, and where drug use is decriminalized, a broader shift in attitude seems possible elsewhere. But as the harm reduction adage goes, one has to want the change in order to make it. When Pereira first opened the CAT in Orleão, he faced vociferous opposition, opposition from residents. They worried that with more drogados would come more crime, but the opposite happened. Months later, one neighbor came to ask Pereira's forgiveness. She hadn't realized it at the time, but there had been three drug dealers on her street. When their local clientele stopped buying, they packed up and left. The CAT building itself is a drab, brown, two-story block, with offices upstairs and an open waiting area, bathrooms, storage, and clinics down below. The doors open at 8.30 a.m., seven days a week, 365 days a year. Patients wander in throughout the day for appointments to chat, to kill time, to wash, or to pick up their weekly supply of methadone doses. They tried to close the CIT for Christmas Day one year, but patients asked that it stay open. For some, estranged from loved ones and adrift from any version of home, this is the closest thing they've got to community and normality. It's not just about administering methadone, Pereira, Pereira told me. You have to maintain a relationship. In a back room, rows of little canisters with banana-flavored methadone doses were lined up, each labeled with the patient's name and information. The Olyong CAT regularly, regularly services about 400 people, but that number can double during the summer months when seasonal workers and tourists come to town. Anyone receiving treatment elsewhere in the country or even outside Portugal can have their prescription sent over to the CAT, making the Algarve an ideal harm reduction holiday destination. After lunch at a restaurant owned by a former CAT employee, the doctor took me to visit another of his projects, a particular favorite. His decades of working with addiction disorders had taught him some lessons, and he poured his accumulated knowledge into designing a special treatment facility on the outskirts of Olion. The Unidade de Desabituação. The Unidade de Desabituação, or Dishabituation Center. Several such UDs, as they are known, have opened in other regions of the country, but this center was developed to cater to the particular circumstances and needs of the South. Pereira stepped down as director some years ago, but his replacement asked him to stay on to help with day-to-day -day operations. Pereira should be retired by now. Indeed, he tried to, but Portugal is suffering from an overall shortage, an overall shortage of health professionals in the public system, and not enough young doctors are stepping into this specialization. As his colleagues elsewhere in the country grow closer to their own retirements, there is a growing sense of dread that there is no one there to replace them. Those of us from the Algarve always had a bit of a different attitude from our colleagues up north, Pereira told me. I don't treat patients. They treat themselves. My function is to help them to make the changes they need to make. And thank goodness there's only one change to make, he deadpanned as we pulled into the center's parking lot. You need to change almost everything. He cackled at his own joke and stepped out of his car. The glass doors at the entrance slid open to a facility that was bright and clean without feeling overwhelmingly institutional. Doctors and administrators' offices were up a sweeping staircase ahead. Women at the front desk nodded their hellos, and Pereira greeted them warmly. Good afternoon, my darlings. The Olion Center was built for just under 3 million euros, publicly funded and opened to its first patients nine years ago. This facility, like the others, is connected to a web of health and social rehabilitation services. It can house up to 14 people at once. Treatments are free, available on referral from a doctor or therapist, and normally last between 8 and 14 days. When people first arrive, they put all their personal belongings, photos, mobile phones, everything, into storage, which are retrievable on departure. We believe in the old maxim, no news is good news, explained Pereira. We don't do this to punish them, but to protect them. Memories can be triggering, and sometimes families, friends, and toxic relationships can be enabling. 
To the left, there were intake rooms and a padded isolation room with clunky security cameras propped up in every corner. Patients each had their own suites, simple, comfortable, and private. To the right, there was a color room with a pottery wheel, recycled plastic bottles, paints, egg cartons, glitter, and other craft supplies. In another room, colored pencils and easels for drawing. A kiln, and next to it a collection of excellent handmade ashtrays. Many patients remained heavy smokers. Patients were always occupied, always using their hands or their bodies or their senses, doing exercise or making art, always filling their time with something. We'd often hear our patients use the expression, me and my body, Pereira said, as though there was a dissociation between the me and my flesh. <clears throat> to help bring the body back, there was a small gym, exercise classes, physiotherapy, and a jacuzzi. And after so much destructive behavior, messing up their bodies, relationships, their lives, and communities, learning that they could create good and beautiful things was sometimes transformational. You know those lines on a running track? Pereira asked me. He believed that everyone, however imperfect, was capable of finding their own way, given the right support. Our love is like those lines. He was firm, he said, but never punished or judged his patients for their relapses or failures. Patients were free to leave at any time, and they were welcome to return if they needed, even if it was more than a dozen times. He offered no magic wand or one-size-fits-all solution, just this daily search for balance. Getting up, having breakfast, making art, taking meds, doing exercise, going to work, going to school, going into the world, going forward. Being alive, he said to me more than once, can be very complicated. My darling, he told me, it's like I always say, I may be a doctor, but nobody is perfect. This has been, Portugal's radical drugs policy is working. Why hasn't the world copied it? Written by Susana Ferreira, Tuesday, 5th of December, 2017. Read and recorded by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. Thursday, June 30th, 2022. Thanks for reading along.